All right. Are you ready for this, Barry? Are you guys ready for this? I think it's finally time we talk about some Vinland Saga on the channel. Let's go! Clank! Mmm! I know, I know, I know. Look, they are the closest sword and shield that I own that would be even close to being historically accurate during this era. It was either this or a katana. And while I think it would have been pretty damn cool to see Thorkel swing around uh, Mihawk's Yoru, not probably very historically accurate, so we're going with the Zelda thing, okay? Also, we got Brook hanging out back here. Now, Brook does not appear in Vinland Saga, but there are copious amounts of corpses and skeletons throughout, so I felt like it was fitting. All right, so today's video on Vinland Saga is going to be broken up into three different parts. Each one is going to be highly disorganized, but I will try to stay on topic as much as possible. The first part is going to be spoiler-free. I'm going to be talking about Vinland Saga just in general terms, what's it about, a little bit about the main character, um, uh, you know, trying to get people into reading it if you haven't read it already, that kind of stuff. The second part of this, I'm going to be talking about the prologue, the first part of the manga, and as well as the entirety of the anime right now. So it's a pretty long prologue, okay? So season two, we'll see where it goes from there, right? Absolutely. And then the third part, um, I think we're going to be uh, covering some very spoiler-heavy recent events in the manga, because what I've been doing with Vinland Saga the past few months is I've actually been kind of like waiting for the chapters to build up a bit, and because it's a monthly series and then I went back a few days ago and read like the last five or six chapters and some major stuff's going on right now so I want to talk about that at the end of the video so to get started with Vinland Saga spoiler free why should you read it Vikings it's about the Vikings which I believe is the correct Norwegian pronunciation of that word I'm just gonna go back to saying Vikings throughout the rest of the video because that's what I've been saying my whole life but I did want to reference that anybody that's Norwegian that's watching this video and is like really pumped like yeah Tekking's talking about Vinland Saga today man he's gonna butcher a lot of words yes I will but I'm hoping at least I got that one right okay so it's about Vikings but I have to say right out of the gate that is just the beginning that is just the foundation stone of what this is this masterpiece by Koto Yukimura. I erroneously assumed, because I knew about Vinland Saga for years, it's been out since like 2006, okay? But I originally assumed it was just your standard seinen battle manga, a lot of war, a lot of blood, swords, armor, all that kind of stuff, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, but I just thought it was that with like a quick Viking coat of paint over it. Like the, um, the mangaka just took, you know, some like pictures of Vikings back in the day and just threw them in the armor, or, like a Viking aesthetic, not really, you know, paying attention to the history or anything. And then that was just what it was, okay? Oh man, was I wrong. I could have been reading this back in like 2006, you know? Oh man, I really missed the boat on that one. So do not make the same mistake I did, okay? My man, Makoto Yukimura, goes 150% with this story, okay? The dude did his history, he traveled to Iceland, he learned about as much as he could about the Viking culture, the history behind it. It takes place in our world during the turn of the first millennium at the 11th century, around 1000 AD, when the Vikings are invading England, um, and there's the Dane Law and everything. Uh, he takes characters or people that actually existed in real life and of course it's a manga so you're gonna have a little bit of artistic license with that the main character is Thorfinn Karlsefni and uh, Thorfinn Karlsefni is a person that actually existed although I don't think he did all of the stuff that actually uh, happened in the story I don't think he was raised uh, as a mercenary at a young age but uh, who knows, historical records from that era are a little spotty, so maybe he was. Thorf Thorfinn Karlsefni, from our world, was one of the men that traveled to Vinland. Vinland being what is modern day, we don't know exactly where it was located because once again the records, it was somewhere around uh, the Labrador Sea on the eastern coast of Canada where like Newfoundland is, okay? Uh, which is of course, this would be the first time Europeans arrived in the Americas, okay? Uh, Leif Erikson is also a character in this, also a little bit of artistic license. I don't think Leif in real life had such a fabulous mustache, but once again, maybe he did. Um, the story literally starts with Leif Erikson, the Leif Erikson giving this really cool story to the main character Thorfinn about his travels to a distant land full of vast pastures and warmth called Vinland, alright? And so this inspires the main character from a young age, always kind of seeking the world of Vinland, trying to travel there. And the way he views it changes throughout his life because the Vinland saga manga is really a saga of Thorfinn and his character of how he evolves. If you like character development, if you like good characterization 
location and all that stuff, this is also the story for you, okay? Because you look at Thorfinn right here on volume one, or maybe if you watch the first episode or whatever, you see Thorfinn looking like this. Trust me, the character is way more than what you might be thinking just from that. Like, you know, I'm the badass, I got swords or daggers, and I cut people up with that. Oh no, no, he is that too. He is that too, most certainly. But Thorfinn's journey is really something, and I can't go beyond that right now in the spoiler-free section. Thorfinn's character evolves and changes multiple times throughout the story, um, you know, in reflection to what's going on in the world around him, okay? Which is very chaotic, given the era which this happens in, okay? So, uh, just keep that in mind there. Um, there are, of course, historical references, uh, during the war, you know, when the, uh, when the Danes invaded England and everything like that. Once again, there's going to be some things that are going to be changed around for the sake of of a manga, uh, but if you like geography, like me, and history, and all that stuff, uh, there's maps, there's diagrams, there's all that kind of stuff. I would really highly recommend getting the uh, hardcover versions of these um, of these manga if you can grab them now, uh, because there's a lot of supplemental information that Makoto puts in here. Um, sometimes just like like let me read this afterward to you right here, okay? And this is like a design of Asklad's sword, you know. So it's not just like I'm gonna draw a sword. No, he actually went through the trouble of learning like okay no how were like the vikings and the danes like their swords that they used at the time or the sword that asklad would use how would they be made how would be th they be laid out and so you get a lot of supplemental information there and so let me just read this afterward because this is great Despite its breezier appearance, all that chainmail that the Vikings wear weighs about 45 pounds. The swords and axes add 6 to 8 pounds each, and once the iron helmets, wooden shields, and short swords are added in, the entire equipment tops out at over 65 pounds. I tried to wear all that armor myself, and I could barely walk, much less fight. I'm truly grateful that I wasn't born in the age of the Vikings. Those guys are monsters. I loved reading that, because it's like, man, this dude actually went out of his way to go and, like, find historically accurate Vikings. Viking battle armor or a replica of such, which is what it probably was, but like the weight and the everything was the same, and tries that on, just like, I'm writing a manga about Vikings. I want to see how they fought, like what they wore and stuff, okay? So just keep that in mind. It is written by someone that truly loves history and, you know, of course, is going to take liberties with it with a manga, of course. But overall, the base of this is rooted in historical fact, all right, with some changes therein wherever it's necessary, of course. But overall, that's like the base of this. So I really have to throw that out there right now, okay? So, um... Spoiler free to go beyond that a little bit more, um, you know, I'm really hesitant to because even though this kind of stuff we find out about Thorfinn happens uh, relatively early on, it, it's, it's I kind of want people to be surprised when you read it when you finally get to that point. I will say this, I will say this about Vinland Saga. So, you'll have some manga, like, let's just use One Piece for an example, because I always talk about that, where you have the main character, and you may not find out about that main character's past and what drives them until way further down into the story. Uh, in One Piece, for instance, we uh, meet Luffy at, well, first chapter, he's like seven years old, and then we skip to when he's 17, and he heads out to begin his journey. But we don't find out about Luffy's past and all the stuff that happened when he was a kid until, like, halfway point of the manga, like, like way down the line, like, you know, 600-something chapters almost, okay? With Vinland Saga, I will say, it starts off with Thorfinn at age, I believe he's 16 here, um, you know, fighting for a mercenary group. And so we get a little bit of introduction to how he is there in Chapter 1, his personality and everything. But we pretty much almost immediately cut back to Thorfinn's past being raised um, in Iceland by his father, Thors, and his mother, Helga, and his sister, Yelva. Hope I got that right. Anyway, the point is, we learn about what drives Thorfinn, what pushes him toward his end goals and his motivation at a very early part of the story. And so we can kind of learn and grow with Thorfinn as the story progresses, okay? So we get a brief introduction of how he is now when the prologue begins, and then we see his past and see what happened to him. And then we move back into the present, and then, then we continue the story, and Thorfinn grows throughout. I don't think it's a spoiler to say this. Um, when we start the story, 
Marty Thorfinn is a teenager, and, you know, in the next arc, he's around 20, in the next arc, he's, like, 22, and in the current arc, he's, like, 25. Okay, so the character very much grows with the story arcs, you know, years go by, a lot of time skips in the story, but considering it's, like, based in history and stuff, you have to, like, line up the dates with certain things and, like, maybe bend it a little bit. So, in that situation, it makes sense, uh, but it flows perfectly well, in my opinion. So beyond that, I'm still trying to think of stuff that I can tell you that's spoiler-free. Um, something that is definitely brought up is that we find out a lot more about Viking culture. All right? Now, once again, not the same as you would get from, like, a classroom or from a book or, you know, whatever. But, you know, Yukimura tries to put that whole thing in there where, like, you know, the Vikings weren't just, like, you know, bloodthirsty warriors. Like, all they did was fight you know, what was a Viking family like? What was their family units like? What were their cultural norms? And all that kind of stuff. Religion! Religion plays a huge, huge underlying role here, okay? Because this was at the time when, um, you know, the pagan traditions were kind of being pushed away by the uh, widespread Christianity kind of spreading. So there's a lot of uh, Vikings or Danes here that are, you know, represented Christianity and stuff. And that plays a very essential role there for a particular character here. Um, this is Prince Canute, and uh, that that's very important to him. There's also a uh, a monk or like a friar by the name of Willibald, and he's also, you know, he's a monk, he's a friar, but there's a lot of stuff with his character I kind of don't want to go into right now. Um, but that kind of stuff is also integral. It isn't just like there, like a, a quick reference or like, he's like, oh, yes, of course, uh, the Vikings worship X, Y, and Z. Okay, now back to fighting. You know, no, it's like very important roles here that affect the characters in profound ways that kind of tumble into what they would be after the next time skip or like, oh, man, like at the end of the prologue. Canute encounters something very profound and kind of comes to an epiphany, like a realization that happens. And so when we skip forward in time, it's like, oh, what kind of person is he going to be after this is over? You know what I mean? So there's a lot of stuff that involves that there. Um, if anything, to end out the spoiler-free section, if anything, reading Vinland Saga made me so, so interested to get out there and learn as much as I could about the Vikings, about the Danes, about Norse culture. Um, I already knew a little bit about mythology, of course, you know, Othin, Thor, all those characters, of course, um, the Bifrost, the Valkyries, all of that stuff. But it, it wanted me to learn more about historically, like, what happened during this era, you know? And so if you're a lover of history and geography as well, I think it'll have the same effect on you. So that would be my final words for spoiler-free reading about Vinland Saga, okay? So go pick it up, absolutely. Um, there's a character I really wanted to mention there, Asklad right here, uh, who's my favorite character, but... I really don't want to spoil it because there's stuff that happens with him that if it would be spoiling. It would be spoiling the twist of the fun finale of the prologue. So I'm going to move on now into that section. Like I said, this is going to be a haphazard kind of transition here. But um, the spoiler-free section's ending. I'll put a little thing down there at the bar. So I hope you guys enjoyed this part. All right. So moving on to this. Asklad's awesome, right? Can we just all look? Asklad's pretty damn cool. All right. Oh, man. You know what? You know what? Makoto Yukimura didn't even need to do the Roman thing. The Lucius Artorius Castus. He didn't even need to do that. All right. Yes. Yes. You got Roman Britain. You got the Romans that, of course, occupied Britain way, way back in the day during the time of the Roman Empire. Um, I believe it was Caesar that invaded during the Gaelic Wars. I think it was around 50 BC or whatever. Okay. And then you have the Roman occupation there. And so everything's going on there and everything. And then the whole story with Asklad, I'm reading this the first time through, and I'm like, are they actually going to tie it in to him? All right, are they actually going to tie it into that? And then, like, then he goes to, as soon as, you know, Wales, the, the little Wales arc there, where they go to Wales, and, like, the whole Roman thing is going on, and then, of course, there was the scene, I love that scene when Asklad and Thorfinn are hanging out next to the town. Um, was it Bath? I don't know if it was Bath. It might have been, because that's the place that the Romans would set up as basically, like, a resort. Like, that was their vacation spot in, in Britain, was Bath. And so, there's the Roman pillars still standing there, and they're, like, you know, collapsed or whatever, and you just 
have that scene where you have Asklad talking to Thorfinn, and Thorfinn really doesn't give a shit about any of this because Thorfinn's only caring about his, like, he's laser focused on his revenge at this point. But Asklad's trying to teach him about the history and how, you know, how it's all cyclical, how it's like the Romans ruled over this country. And then the Anglos and the Saxons came from northern Germany, and then they took this place over. Uh, the Frisians were also there too, from the Netherlands, you know? And so they all came over, and then they took over England, and now here we are, the Danes, the Vikings, uh, taking over uh, England from the, uh, the, the, the Angles and the Saxons. England, Anglo, that's, that's where that comes from. Okay, of course. Um, so I love that, that little historical note there, and he tosses him the Roman coin and everything. And then when we got to the point of Wales, I'm like, holy crap, this is awesome. This is so cool. That was my moment reading this where I was just like, why didn't I read this earlier? Okay, and so, uh, so Lucius Artorius Castus, uh, around the second, third century, was a battle commander during the Roman uh, occupation of Britain, back during the Roman Empire and everything, and he is one of the uh, inspirations for the legend of King Arthur. And I, I could probably do a whole rant uh, separately about that, about Arthurian lore and about like, you know, what are all the inspirations for King Arthur? Did King Arthur actually exist? All I'm going to say about it to kind of keep it as quick as possible here so we can move on to more Vinland Saga, but I have to gush about Roman stuff really quick. Okay, here's the deal. History is a very fun thing, you know, because you have these awesome legends that would be passed down, and imagine you live during this time. Imagine you live during the time of Vinland Saga. I mean, yeah, it would kind of suck. I mean, really, I mean, yeah, there's, you know, moments in here where the characters have a little bit of peace and stuff, but overall, it would kind of suck, right? And so there's battles, and there's war, and there's blood, and there's gore, and there's shit, like figurative and literal shit on the battlefield, right? So every now and then, it's nice to have a story, a story of an epic knight or a king or a warrior that, you know, was just like the best ever, like, you know, was basically a demigod that like slashed, yes, our great hero, you know, Lucius Artorius Castus sliced down all of them. Now, he was a real person, but... History adds over the course of centuries, and of course historians, you know, they didn't write things down the exact same way that historians would write things down now. You know, literacy rates were very low back then, and of course at the end of the day, stories that are epic kind of spread a little bit easier. So over the course of centuries, you would have the story of King Arthur. You know, if King Arthur was real, stories about finding the crypt of King Arthur and Guinevere and everything. You know, he was a real person. He was based on this person who was a battle commander. No, he was based on this person who was an actual king. No, there's this king that was named after him. You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, it, it, it's probably likely that King Arthur, the way that we think of King Arthur, didn't actually exist. Um, but Lucius Artorius Castus was definitely someone that had a legend probably built up around him way more epic than what actually happened in his life just over the course of centuries. And then that was the inspiration that uh, Makoto Yukimura took here for Asklad's character. I can imagine that he basically looked at all these Arthurian legends and everything, and like, this this is one angle you could take it, this is another angle you could take it, and he chose to go the Roman Lucius Artorius Castus route with it. And so that backbuilt uh, Asklad's entire character, and, you know, him being, like, truly the, you know, the king of England, like that really awesome scene there where he's facing down King Sven, um, that's where it all came from. But I love that he did that. Uh, Makoto didn't need to do that. Uh, he could have had references, to, you know, to the Roman occupation of Britain throughout the story. That could have still been a thing. Um, you know, and the whole thing with Wales, that could have been a reference there. But just creating a character like Asklad, that was just a treat. That was just a bonus for me reading this story, okay? So, um, that's, that's Asklad. <laughs> I just had to talk about him first, if we're gonna do talking about prologue stuff, okay? Um, I love Thorkel. I, I feel like Thorkel is going to be the one that a lot of people are going to want to talk about. He's like the Kempachi Zaraki of like, you know, Vinland Saga, of course. And Thorkel the Tall, another example of this, somebody that actually existed. He was an Earl of Denmark. He later becomes an Earl of Denmark in the story, in Vinland Saga, of course. Um, but of course, uh, even during his time period, there was a lot of, you know, myth and lore built around him. So even, it wasn't even like somebody dies and then like 300 years later, they're back built to be like this amazing warrior that can cut down a thousand 
thousand men in battle or something like that. Sometimes this stuff would happen just in like in their lifetime, you know, like there'd be a great battle where there'd be this uh this uh mighty Viking and he would like defeat a few people, and then you have some people talking about the story in a bar later in a tavern, like, oh man, yeah, Thorkel, he killed like 30 people in one attack and then that gets built up like over the course of months and years of like man i i heard he wiped out 30 people you know by throwing a giant tree trunk at them and then cut to a few years later man man i heard he killed 300 people by throwing a boat at them you know it's these kind of stories that existed on the battlefield that boosted morale there was a function to it they, you know, back then they weren't like, hey guys, maybe we should go easy on the stories. Maybe we're being a little bit too crazy and fictitious and like a thousand years from now, historians are going to be puzzled whether or not half this stuff even happened and just be like, yeah, no, they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about, that's our commander, Thorkel the Tall. He slaughters people wherever he goes. He's like a freaking bulldozer. What are those? Whatever. Let's go. You know, like. That, that, so that literally, that's like Thorkill's character, all right? Thorkill's character is like living legend brought into existence, you know, here in manga format, although he really did exist, but this is the myth of Thorkill the Tall, all right? Certainly, all the stuff that he's capable of in this story, absolutely insane character, um, but, you know, a fan favorite, certainly. I guess I should talk about Thorfinn at this point. It's like, ask lad, Thorkill then Thorfinn. All right, well, we'll talk about Thorfinn there. Also, I love the historical, I love the accuracy of the names, because a lot of Vikings, of course, were named after the gods, so you have Thor, you know, and of course, there's going to be a lot of Vikings running around with Thor in their name, right? Of course, there's going to be. So, you might say, from a manga standpoint, though, that might be a little bit confusing, you know, uh, you know, to have all these characters with similar sounding names, but that's the deal. That's, you know, historically accurate. So we have Thor's, uh, Thor's Snorsen, who is the father of Thorfinn Karl Sefni, who, that's not actually his last name. That's like a title, like man among men, or to become a true man or something, um, is the translation of that in some way. And, uh, the way that Thorfinn Karl Sefni got that in real, in, in our real life is different from the way that Thorfinn got it here by fighting Thorkel and defeating him. That's how he kind of got it there. But another thing, it's like a parallel universe. It all, it all kind of sinks back there, of course. Um, so, uh, oh shit, what was I talking about now? I was gonna go, ran I was talking about the names. I got really excited about the names. And then you also have Thor Kill, that also has Thor in the name. Makes sense, given Thor, you know, the god of lightning and all that kind of stuff. You know, that makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, so Thorfinn. Okay, so I think from just watching the first season of the anime or reading the prologue of the manga, uh, you get Thorfinn as just like, okay, He's, you know, your standard, not your standard uh, shonen protagonist. He's your standard seinen protagonist. Um, he is a teenager that is really good at killing things, all right? And he's out for revenge against Asklad because Asklad's band, his mercenary group, are the ones that killed his father. Uh, and that is, of course, you find that out relatively early on in the story of Thorfinn's backstory as a child and stowing away on his father's ship as he's heading back to join the Cholms, uh, the, 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 the Yom's Vikings to uh, fight in this upcoming battle to invade England, okay? And so you find out all about that, and so it's like, okay, all right, you got your standard revenge plot line. All right, that's, it's been done before, but here it's handled very well. Although I will say, throughout the first arc of the story, Thorfinn's character, as I think intentionally, kept very simple. He lashes out, he's got anger issues, uh, he has this grudge against Asklad, uh, he's very foul-mouthed, uh, he tells, he just says whatever's on his mind, you know, um, that is Thorfinn's character, okay? And after the prologue, after the death of Asklad at the end of the first season of the anime and all that stuff, we get Thorfinn's character development properly. <laughs> Hey everybody, how you doing? Editing Teching here. I'm just going to pause the video really quick. So I know I said this part was just about the prologue, uh, or the first arc of Vinland Saga. Yeah, at this point, I'm now moving, once again, haphazardly into the rest of the story. So I felt like I should just stop the video right here and let you know. If you've only seen the first season of the anime, or if you don't want to, you know, anything that happens in the manga beyond this in future story arcs, um, yeah, I get into that from this point onward. So, sorry, just letting you know. You know, what kind of person is Thorfinn going to be 
after that. And there's, you know, a break in, you know, uh, opinion on this. Um, you know, there's one group that you could look at Thorfinn during the first part of this story and say, oh yeah, Thorfinn the badass, the warrior, he's going to fight, he cuts them all down, man, this guy is cool. And then in the subsequent arcs after that, uh, Thorfinn, the character, actually tries to move away from that as fast as possible. From a broken man that has had everything taken away from him, his drive to continue onward, his revenge is just shattered into a million pieces uh, during the arc where he becomes a slave working on the farm. And then after that, you have his sort of redemption, where his attempts at redemption, where he decides that he's going to build a new world in Vinland. And so in order to do that, he has to kind of try to move on beyond his past. But given all of the people that he's killed, that's going to be very difficult for him to accomplish. Along the way, he meets people like Hild that refuse to forget about what's happened. Like that is his constant reminder that of the person he was in the past, that he's never truly going to run away from that. His night terrors where he envisions the corpses of all the people that he's killed in the past, dragging him down into, like, the pits of hell. Like, those scenes are very, you know, like, Makoto is an amazing artist, so it's really cool to see all that kind of stuff, but that's where it really hits the meat of the bone for me. You know, like, I, I, I feel like if Thorfinn was just this character throughout the entire story, um, I wouldn't be as attached to the story as I was. So he's just, like, an angry guy that cuts people down his entire life. And that's it. Um, I'm sure artistically and like in terms of the battles and everything, that would be really, really cool. Personally, though, I find it way more, way more palpable in the story during the scene, during the, uh, the Baltic Sea War arc where uh, Thorfinn meets Floki, the person that paid Asklad to kill his father. And at this point, Thorfinn is sort of trying to, you know, change his life. He's like, we're going to go to the east, we're going to get some money and some gold and all that stuff and provisions to finance an expedition so we can go to Vinland. Vinland, this, um, this sort of mythical place that I've been told about since I was a little kid from Leif Erikson. That this place is a clean slate, a place where, um, you know, my past can maybe be washed away, a place where I can build a town, a settlement that's free from violence and bloodshed. This is the Thorfinn that we have now that's trying to become that person. And then he encounters the man that is responsible for the death of his father. The man that you can also argue is responsible for Thorfinn's revenge against Asklad for so many years that put him on that path. If, in a lot of ways, if Floki never came to Iceland, if he never, um, you know, told Thors, like, hey, you need to come fight back in, you know, uh, you need to come back to Denmark and you need to fight with us to invade England and everything, um, Thorfinn's life would be completely different. And so that moment where he shouts at Floki, like, Floki! You know, like, it's like, okay, now where this is going to go. Because the old Thorfinn wouldn't have thought twice. The second he found out about Floki and what happened with his dad, Thorfinn would be taking out his knives uh, and would be attacking Floki with everything that he had, even if there was like a hundred Jolms uh, Vikings in the way. You know what I mean? Like, he would have cut them all down to get to Floki's head. But now we have a different kind of Thorfinn. What's he going to do now? How's this going to go? I found that way more palpable considering all the things that happen with the character. I think a lot of stuff, um, a lot of negative stuff comes from the slave arc because it is such a rapid departure from the Thorfinn that we knew, you know, where you see Thorfinn here and then you see Thorfinn here. And I understand that arc um, out of all of the arcs of Vinland Saga, it is probably my least favorite. Um, there's only four major arcs in the story. Uh, there's the prologue, there's the, you know, the war arc in England, then the slavery arc, and then the Eastern Expedition or the Baltic Sea War arc, because that takes up like 30-something chapters in and of itself. And then finally the Vinland arc, or Sailing to the West, okay? So out of those four, I would say the slavery one is my least favorite. Uh, still a great arc, though. Uh, but I think the reason why there's some people were kind of jarred by it was it's like now Thorfinn this kid that had such a burning rage inside of him for revenge is now just a broken man. Uh, he's about 20 years old now. Uh, Asklad's been dead for a few years. He's been sold into slavery now. The whole point of everything he lived his life up until now is gone. Um, just dead on the floor as soon as Asklad hit the floor, right? And so now he's just like living day by day. 
And he doesn't even, you get the sense he doesn't even care he's been sold into slavery. He doesn't even care that his life is crap. And he's just like, I just, I have no point. I have no purpose anymore, right? Um, everything I thought was the point of existence is just ripped away from me. And now, now he just chops down trees all day, every day, just like, you know, tell me something to do. Okay, I'll do it. Um, and then eventually, of course, Anar shows up, probably mispronouncing his name. He shows up, they become bros. And that whole point of the slavery arc is that bond there that they share and to try to make a new, better life. But it's like, it, it needs to be broken down before it needs to be built back up again. All right, very much so is um, uh, the slavery arc of Vinland Saga and the transition that... Um, that uh, Thorfinn has to make from, you know, like, I feel the revenge fire burning in my soul for you, Asklad! Moving on to, like, I need to make a better world to live, all right? That had to happen if it was going to be any sort of, not to, not to use a, a word, I've used palpable a lot here, not to be believable. Like, it had to be that. It had to be a whole arc, in my opinion. I felt like if that was just a few chapters where Thorfinn is broken down and then he just recovers himself, or we just do a really quick time skip and we just gloss over that part of his life, that would have cheapened it. That would have cheapened it for me. There had to be a moment where we spent with Thorfinn like that, where he's broken and see how he can get back up again and, you know, uh, dedicate himself to building a better world and a better life for himself. So moving on now from the slave arc, we have the Eastern Expedition or the Baltic Sea War arc. Uh, very long arc, very good arc. Uh, the Baltic Sea War, I think it goes from like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to like 36. Very long string of chapters, but introduces some interesting characters and got some really cool action scenes, of course. Um, by the way, have I mentioned just the art style yet? I just wanted to bring that up too. The things, like, it's like the shading and stuff is good enough. But another thing that Makoto does really well is whenever you have a close-up of any sort of Viking's arms or hands or their skin in a close-up way um, Makoto draws them like rough you know like the fingernails are all chipped and dirt's underneath it and the skin is all like you know maybe scarred or rough you know they, they lived in an era without moisturizing cream is all I'm saying and uh, Yuki Mura does a great job of conveying that whenever like you're doing close-up shots uh, the lines on a character's faces of course you got to keep in mind during this time period you know the life expectancy was a lot lower like if you could make it to age 50 that's pretty damn monumental, okay? And so, but if you did make it to that age, or even older than that, you would probably look twice your age, really. All right, in the Vinland Saga world, okay? It's just a very rough kind of era to live in, especially in a lot of these climates, like Iceland, and it's like, you know, the Norse countries, and it's all very cold, and, and it's very brutal in that kind of area, and I think Makoto um, conveys that really well. But anyway, Baltic Sea War, okay. One chapter that I have to mention here. I feel like this whole part of the story kind of does warrant its own discussion. Um, and so we might do that at some point. But I have to mention a single chapter that occurs during the Baltic Sea War. And it's a chapter that really comes out of nowhere. Um, it doesn't really, it features Thorkill, but kind of barely. But despite that, it is a chapter that literally took my breath away when I first read it. It was one of those chapters where I read it, and then I was just like, Holy shit. Um, okay, wow. And it just, it comes out of the blue. It comes right out of the blue. And, and, and Makoto just put it in there, okay? Chapter 154 of Vinland Saga. The chapter title is The Baltic Sea War Part 30. In the chapter, it's a brief chapter too. It's all relative. It's a quick chapter for a monthly series in particular. Okay, you wait a month for this chapter, you get it, and it's just... In the chapter, you have a member of Thorkel's army. And they're fighting the Holmes Vikings. Okay? And so, he's holding off a bunch of the Holmes Vikings. He's taken a bunch down with him. But he's just simply outnumbered. And he gets bombarded with arrows and gets stabbed and he's about to die. He hits the floor. He's bleeding out. He's just covered in arrows and wounds and he's just like a giant puddle of blood. He's going to die. There's no way he can be saved. And the entire chapter is, I'm not even kidding, the last fleeting moments of this man's life as he's losing his consciousness, as he's laying there on the ground, Unable to move. I think he lost an arm or a leg along the way. He's on the ground in a pool of his own blood. Vision beginning to get blurry. 
sounds starting to cut out. He sees one final scene of his commander, Thorkel the Tall, rampaging through the battlefield with like a giant freaking tree trunk, just BOOM! And he's like, yep, that's my captain. He's gonna give him hell. Your days are numbered, Jones Vikings. You're not gonna be able to win. And he's there, and his vision begins to get blurry, and he's just like, well, I guess it's time for me to punch out. Time for me to move on to Valhalla. Time for me to party with Othin and Thor. The Valkyries are going to descend from on high. Everything's going to light up. These beautiful Valkyries are going to appear and take me on top their white horses. And we're going to gallop across the Bifrost Bridge into Valhalla, where I'm going to spend the rest of my days fighting and eating that pig that con continually regenerates every single time. Read Norse mythology. It's freaking wacko, but I love it. All right. That pig that you just constantly keep eating in Valhalla. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be gorgeous. His vision slowly dies out. Sound slowly cuts out. So he's left with just in the last few seconds of his life, just his thoughts. And it's darkness. Just darkness. Nothing. And he's there and he's dumbfounded by this. He's like, wait, what? Where, where are the Valkyries at? Where, where, where are they? Hey, uh, hey, uh, that's, hey, come on now. Where's the, where's the rainbow bridge to Valhalla? Where are the Valkyries? Where's the, the beautiful celestial song that's going to carry me into the next life? Where's that at? Where, uh, where, where, what's going on here? That's, I, I don't understand. They told me that if I fought and died in battle honorably, then I get to go to Valhalla, right? Right? I fought a bunch of battles. I, I fought under Thorkel the Tall, for God's sake. I, I took the lives of so many people. They guaranteed that I was going to have a ticket to Valhalla after this. What's going on? And his last moments of life are him realizing that there is nothing after death. And he's like, is this what happens to everybody? This is terrifying. This is horrible. And he's just there fading out. And the last thing he thinks of is... Boss, Thorkel, everybody, it's all a lie. It's just a lie. It's one big lie. There is no Valhalla. There are no Valkyries. Guys, please don't just... And then you just pan out and you see a scene with his dead body lying on the ground. Tears coming down his cheek. And that's the end of the freaking chapter. Once again, keep in mind, this comes out of nowhere! All right, like literally we're having a battle and we're focusing on the other characters and everything and they're fighting and everything. This one chapter out of nowhere, just like boom, punches us right in the feels. All right, and then it goes back to that. It's just like, yeah, yeah. Yukimura's just sitting there. He's like, all right, all right. Baltic Sea War number 28. Gotcha. Baltic Sea War number 29. Part 30. Oh, I'm going to mess with them on part 30. Yeah, oh yeah. And then we're going to move on to part 31. All right. And that chapter is so damn powerful because most of this story, like I said, there's such a background, not even background a lot of times. A lot of times it is front and center, the religion uh, of the Vikings and then Christianity and everything. That is a big focus on this story. And you learn about this. And of course, the people, the, the Vikings that are a little bit more, you know, like under Thorkel and everybody, they believe in Valhalla and everything. There was even a, there was even a moment earlier on in the prologue where they have a, a discussion on who would win in a fight, Thor or Jesus Christ. And so there was like, you know, scenes like that and stuff. Like that's the kind of stuff they talked about, right? And so it, it just builds to that one scene there where the guy is dying and he just realizes that like there is no Valkyrie, there is no Bifrost you know, what are we even fighting for here? You know, and, and that, that was something that, um, of course, the other people wouldn't know about because he only found out about it right before he was about to die. And so that's like a thing where it's just like he found out that they were fighting for really none of the glory they were told about. And now he can't tell anybody and now he's dead. And that happens to like everybody. And so, yeah, that was, that was, that was, that was a moment. That was a moment in the story where I'm like, that is that I, I read that chapter, you know, and I'm like, I'm never going to forget this chapter. That is one of those chapters when it comes to a manga that is going to just be with me for the rest of my life. All right. That that was done out of left field, but it didn't feel forced. It felt very natural while in the middle of this massive war, you would have a soldier that dies and then reflects on the afterlife and what it really is. And if it 
it did or did not exist, right? So, yeah. So, I, I, I plan on talking more about the Baltic Sea War, but I just had to bring up that one chapter, because that was probably the one chapter. I mean, there was a lot of really really powerful scenes in this uh, story that I remember, but that was probably the one that stuck with me the most, you know? Uh, but anyway, uh, now let's move on to uh, the recent stuff. Let's move on to that, and we'll close out the video with this. Okay, so we're in the Vinland Saga arc of Vinland Saga, where they're actually traveling to Vinland in the last chapter. They actually made it there, or rather, they made it to a location that Leif made it to, where the, he called Vinland, but now they're going to be moving down even more southward. Uh, this is historically accurate, actually. So, leaving Greenland, uh, there's the saga of the Greenlanders, and then there's the saga of Eric the Red. And the saga of the Greenlanders came first, uh, which might have a little bit more historical accuracies on how this, this these whole trips and these expeditions went. And then the saga of Eric the Red came, I think, like 50 or 60 years later, and that might have mythologized a lot of what happened. Okay, once again, history is a very funny thing. In some, the, the most common translation for Vinland is the land of grape vines or the land of wine. All right, because you find grapes everywhere, and that was it. There's also references to just the land of a pasture. Uh, keep in mind, a lot of the Vikings, a lot of the Danes living where they did during the time, you know, Greenland, Iceland, you know, things like pastures and things um, weren't very prevalent. You know, um, they did farm, of course, but it was a very different kind of farming that would have existed in a place like Vinland, okay? So they called it that. So there's a few, um, there, there's a few ways that you can describe Vinland and exactly the translation what it really meant, okay? But um, in the context of Vinland Saga, uh, we travel through the Labrador Sea relatively quickly. Uh, they reach Helland, and then they go to Markland, and then they reach Vinland all in a single chapter. All in the last chapter, all that stuff happens, okay? Uh, and I understand, you know, the sea voyages might be kind of, you know, to have like a 10, 20 chapter mini arc where you're traveling on the ocean. That might be a little bit too much. And of course, the whole name of the story is Vinland Saga, so let's go to Vinland. We're finally getting there. Let's just get there. So, um, this is something that takes a lot from historical, you know, at least the, the saga of the Greenlanders that has actually written there, where Leif Erikson arrives first, and they build a few houses, and then they encounter the, um, the indigenous people of the Americas, uh, which would be probably the uh, descendants of the Inuits, okay? Or I guess, yeah, the ancestors of the Inuits, right? And so they attacked the Greenlanders, and so forced them back. And then uh, there was an expedition later, led by Thorfinn, uh, Carl Sefni, that headed down through the same kind of path that Leif Erikson took. And then he reached the area where there was a broken ship, and then there were the houses that Leif built. And so they found those in the last chapter, but they also found the arrows fired by the natives. And so Thorfinn is like, we need to find a place that is not inhabited, a place that we can have truly to ourselves, the true Vinland. So we have to go somewhere, not here. We need to keep going further south, which is something that also did happen in the actual story uh, or the historical context that we understand. They kept traveling even further south. They landed in probably what is most likely Newfoundland uh, today in Canada. Um, that's where Thorfinn settled and they had a settlement for a little while. There were natives there as well. A war broke out, a battle broke out at any rate. Um, you know, the Vikings killed a lot of their men. They killed a lot of the Vikings, and they decided, you know what, let's just leave. And then they abandoned the expedition, I believe, after two months. So they had a settlement that lasted about two months, and then they went back to Markland, which is where there was a base that was set up, like a supply base, which did also happen in the last chapter of Vinland Saga, where they break off their unit, and they kind of set it up there in Markland, and then they decide to go back to Greenland. Historically, that's what happened. So, at this point, man... I'm kind of hoping, at this point, given our journey with Thorfinn, this Thorfinn in the story of Vinland Saga, and everything that he went through, I kind of want Makoto to kind of change history a bit here. I really do. I kind of want Thorfinn to have his happy ending. I kind of want him to maybe, yeah, you still have an arc where they encounter the natives, and so they have an interaction with them, but I kind of want to have a scene where Thorfinn does make it to a place of untouched land, even if it wouldn't be historically accurate. He just kind of changes around the story a bit. So they arrive at this untouched land, and it's Vinland, his Vinland, and then the Vikings just set up a settlement, and the history, as far as we're concerned, has shifted a little bit from that point onward. Um, 
but I would feel kind of bad. I mean, and it, it might be just like Makoto might not care. He's like, well, that's what's going to happen. Like Thorfinn arrives, they create a settlement. It lasts for a few months, um, but then they have to retreat back to Greenland, back to Iceland. And maybe you could have a thing where Thorfinn is like, Vinland is in your heart not in a place or but that would be like devastating for him because his whole thing is by the way another thing when Thorfinn when Thorfinn Carl Sefni from you know our world went there he didn't do the no weapons shit all right he, they brought weapons they brought weapons they brought swords they brought armor they brought all of that all right to the new world okay this Thorfinn has a, a strict no violence policy when it comes to all that stuff so already you're changing things um, but yeah, I, I, I kind of want to see him have his happy ending though at the end of this, considering everything he went through, but also, I mean, it might not very well have a happy ending. It might have an ending where Thorfinn dies, uh, in the land that he, you know, f he, he fought for so long to just reach and it might be that, or he might have to retreat like the historical Thorfinn, uh, what happened there. Maybe that's how it's going to go. Not really sure, but if you haven't read Vinland Saga in a while, I would definitely recommend getting caught up because it's getting really, really good. And with that being said, we've been doing this for, oh, about an hour for me. I got to edit this down, of course. I made a lot of mispronunciations. Still probably did in the finished version. But at any rate, uh, yeah, that's my Vinland Saga video. I'm glad I finally got this out. Thanks for watching, everybody, and let me know how you felt about this so we can make uh, videos about this in the future. There's a lot of characters in this story. There's a lot of different aspects of this. I can make a whole video on Asklad, or Thorkel or Kanut or any of these characters I could probably make a whole thing a, a whole big series about so uh, let me know what you think Leif Erikson there you go Leif Erikson day hinga dinga durgan um yeah <laughs> have a great day everybody teching Barry Clone Barry 001 signing out to Vinland